Presented by Caltech. So let's just jump right in to where we left off last time with a pretty nice example about diatomic molecules. And let me try and convince you that even in the most subatomic scales, oscillations form a very important part of how things work. So think about hydrogen, the molecule, right? So think about the diatomic molecule hydrogen. Pretty simply, it's just two atoms of H, which are interacting with one another. The separation between them, let's say, is X. So this distance here is X. Now, of course, people have worked out how the, the physics of this molecule really works like. And the potential energy function, U of X, of this hydrogen molecule, for example, let's say is given by minus A over X to the sixth plus B over X to the, X to the twelfth, where A and B are positive constants. So that's a model for how the energy of the hydrogen molecule varies with the distance between the two particles. Okay? And just think physically what might be going on here. There might be an attractive force between these two atoms, uh, Van der Waals forces, polarizations, a bunch of stuff happens. And once they try and get too close to one another, there can be other more repulsive forces, like strong force, which try and intervene and send the atoms apart. So there is a kind of an attractive and a repulsive force in this system here. Okay? And because of which, I can try and understand how the forces on this setup works and how it might you know, behave under small oscillations. So I'm trying to convince you the fact that, just look at this expression right here. Does anyone see a simple harmonic motion just by looking at it? From where I stand, it's not 1 half kx squared. It looks pretty not a damn different. Right? Weird powers in the negative, but I convince you that, okay, this is a good example that I can like, see the fact that around equilibrium, around local minima, you can expect oscillations regardless of the actual shape of this curve, like what A and B might be. There will always be oscillations around the local minima. So you might wonder, is there even a local minima existing? Is there a point of equilibrium where the net forces balance out? And right off the bat, you actually have to see you have a negative sign and a positive sign. So there is hope. Things could cancel off, and there could be a point where the net force really vanishes out. Okay? So let's find the net force between the two particles. So what f of x again? You have the u, just differentiate it, okay? So minus partial u, partial x. Again, we're working in one dimension. It's just one coordinate. Hence, it's minus du dx. All right, differentiation. Let's see. What, what's the differentiation for that? The minus from the definition of the force. That's that. I differentiate this. <coughs> x to the minus 6 gives me a minus 6 a over x to the 7th. And from here, I have a minus... 12x7b um, over x to the 13. Did I get that right? I am missing the minus sign from here, so this becomes a plus. Okay? Simple differentiation for the function. So that's my force. So the force acting on these particles as a function of x, it's just minus 6a over x to the 7 um, plus. 12b over h of 13. Let's just glare at this for a minute. The term with the positive part, the 12b over h of 13, is a repulsive force, right? It goes with x. The sign of x, if it's positive, it sends you away from it. So this term here is repulsive. And this term here, is attractive. Just, just look at it. It's so pretty, right? Something about the seventh part is so attractive about it. So the negative sign here is what makes this force attractive. It pulls you towards the two particles together. So this term here is an attractive force, and that's a repulsive force. So one can expect a certain location where these two forces cancel out, and there could be an equilibrium 
where the, where the, where the net force on the particle vanishes. Okay? The takeaway from all of this stuff is going to be there is a logic to be followed. In any problem, first find the point of equilibrium. That's your starting point. That's where the money is. About the equilibrium points, things when they oscillate, they show, they, they show simple harmonic motion. Okay? So I have the force. I want to find the equilibrium point. So what do I do? I put the board down. All right. uh, this classroom is not the best design, I think, because the boards get blocked up all the way. So I, I try my best not to interfere, but we'll see how that goes. OK, so equilibrium. So it's that point, x equals x naught, let's say, where the force vanishes. OK, the net force is zero. I have an expression, just plug it back, what do you get? This is minus 6a over x0 to the 7th, plus 12b over x0 to the 13th. This is only at equilibrium. Slightly away from that, this will not be valid. Just at that point, x equals x0. Okay? And I can solve this too. This is not, it's not hard to solve. x0 cannot be 0. It has to be more than 0. So that, that's gone. So x9 is um, uh, 2b over a to the power 1 sixth. Simple algebra. Just move it around. 6 cancels the 12 with the 2. 7 goes 13 with the power of 6. Reduce the power down. That's your x9. So that's the point where the net force on this system is 0. That's the point of equilibrium. Okay. All right. And let me just define something called alpha for convenience later on. Let me call alpha as 6a <laughs> over x0 to the 7. Just defining it. This term here, I'm calling it alpha. And since it's an equilibrium point, x0, this is also equal to 12p over x0 to the 13. I mean, that's how I got this condition, right? I'm just defining this thing because it's it's clumsy to write that down 6a over x to the 7 every time we talk about it. Okay, so that's my that's my equilibrium point. Now what do you do? You want to see what happens if I perturb my system slightly away from equilibrium. So now if my x is x naught plus some small dv. And I'm claiming the fact that I'm only looking at small uh, displacements. So delta x over x naught is much, much less than 1. Okay? It's, it's small perturbation. OK. So I have that. I have what the force looks like as a function of x. I can just plug and see what happens. So f at x, I just plug this in back there. So I have minus 6a over x naught plus delta x to the seventh, the attractive piece of the force, plus 12b over x naught plus delta x to the 13th. Okay? Now this looks horrible. That delta x's, that are powers, in the negative, things look hard and horrible. But let's see what happens. We are working in a special regime that the displacements about the equilibrium are small displacements. And because of that, Let's try and factorize out x naught in both of these terms in the denominator. Okay, so let's see what we can do. So let's pull the x naughts out. So I have minus 6a over x naught to the 7 times 1 plus delta x over x naught to the minus 7 plus 12b over x naught to the 13th times 1 plus delta x over x naught to the minus 13. I did nothing fancy there, just pulled the x naughts out and wrote the powers as a negative on top. Everyone see that? It's not hard, just like following it up in class. If someone's missing the point, you ask me. We gotta keep asking more questions. Everyone see it? Nots? Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so that's my force. Let me switch boards. Now just look at the form of these two parenthetical, parenthetical terms. 
1 plus delta x over x naught to some power. And I'm claiming the fact that I'm looking only for small displacements. Hence, delta x over x naught is much, much less than 1. And therefore, I can binomial expand or Taylor expand these two bracket terms. Okay? So remember, 1 plus a small number to the power n is 1 plus n times a small number plus n times n minus 1 small number squared over 2 factorials, yada, yada, yada. Ring a bell? Okay. Let's get the force again. So f of x is now approximately, because I'm binomial expanding out my, my bracket terms, is minus 6a over x naught to the 7. So 1 plus the small quantity to the minus 7 till first order is 1 minus 7 times that number. Question? OK. So this is 1 minus. 7 delta x over x naught. Then the higher terms, which I'm neglecting because delta x over x naught is less than 1. And plus 12b over x naught to the 13th. 1 minus 13 delta x over x naught. Does everyone see that? I did a binomial expansion there. And plus, I truncated my terms to first order. Um, if, if it's like much, much less than one, why don't you just ignore it in the like, first step? So if I could just completely get rid of that. So delta x in this thing, this number could be dropped off. Oh, then it's just it's a zero, order. right? Okay. So to zeroth order, you're so close to the equilibrium that nothing has ever happened. But in the first order effect, something is happening. That's a good question. And this, is, this tells you about how the physics of things really work like. At different orders in perturbation theory, things look different. If you zoom out of something, things just look you know, nice and easy. Like for example, let's say the Earth. If I zoom out enough, it's just a sphere. It's just like a solid sphere, right? If I zoom in on smaller scales, things are more dynamic. Similarly, if I zoom out, so that delta x just looks so tiny to me, and therefore nothing ever happens in that small oscillation. But if I zoom in enough, something starts happening. If I zoom in much more closely, I must take into account the higher order terms. It's a matter of scales again. That's a good question to ask. Thank you. OK. All with me so far? Any questions about binomials, the force, anything? OK. All right. So now I had a nice four-sided vision. I called this alpha. This two was alpha. So now we can you know, have a much more compact form of the equation. This is alpha is common on both sides because this is alpha and this is alpha from the equilibrium condition. Okay. So this is alpha times minus one plus seven delta x over x naught plus 1 minus 13 delta x over x naught. Let's combine everything together. The 1 goes away, the 1 wee, goes away. Combine the 2, what do I have? I have minus 13 alpha over x naught times delta x. Plug back alpha in, this equals minus 13 over Start, oh sorry, minus six. Minus six. Yeah. Minus six over x naught times alpha. And alpha is either this or that, doesn't matter. Let's just put anything you like. Let's put six a over x naught to the seven times delta x. And this is the force. Okay? And by Newton's second law, the force is m times x double dot x is x naught plus delta x. x naught is a constant value of the equilibrium. Hence, x naught double dot is zero, just a number. Okay? So this is just m times delta x double dot. And lo and behold, what do I have? m times d squared over dt squared of delta x 
equals minus 36 a over x naught to the eighth times the thrill of victory, right? We started off with a weird looking potential which had attractive and repulsive terms, but for small oscillations, for small displacements, it looks like mx double dot is minus a constant times the displacement again. That's a simple harmonic motion. Do we all see that? Question. Could you have done this with like a Taylor extension? That's what we did. Okay. Right? Because so, yeah. going from here to this step is a Taylor expansion. Oh. And if you wanted to see that pretty very quick. So one plus some small value y to the power n. Do you see that expansion? This is one plus n times y plus n times n minus one y squared over two factorial plus so on and so forth. What we're calling binomial here is the Taylor expansion for this function. So you do the differentiations. This is what you would get. So this is the Taylor series. Excellent. Anything else? So we started off with um, a diatomic molecule, and we showed the fact that for small displacements of equilibrium, it looks like a simple harmonic oscillator. Okay? And just see how this looks like more diagrammatically. Um, the, the energy function, u of x, if I plot that out, it again has these two pieces, the attractive and the repulsive part. The attractive part is the one with the a, the repulsive one is the one with the b. The attractive part is always negative. Okay, so the attractive, maybe I should. Maybe I should draw my axis a little bit there. That's x. And the attractive part goes like that. So this is minus 60 over x to the sixth. The attractive part of the things. And the repulsive part is. Repulsive version, so this is 12b over x to the seven. We can all see that, okay? As x goes to zero, they both blow up in the opposite directions. When you add these two together, you get a curve, something like that. And if you're taking some form of chemistry in some class, I am sure you've seen this curve before, right? So this is the point of equilibrium that we're talking about. This is the point x naught, where the tangent to the u of x curve is zero. It's a horizontal tangent. And therefore, the net force at this point is balanced out. Attractive and repulsive force is balanced. And the magic again. The curve looks bizarre. But around this point, if you look closely enough, take your microscope, take a zoom in lens, just, just go real close. You know what I mean? And what you find is it looks like a parabolic thing. So it's quadratic in the energy, which means it's linear in the force. And therefore, for small displacements, the thing just jiggles back and forth. Okay? So that's the beauty of this thing. Arbitrary curves around the point of equilibrium, small displacements, you're good to go. You know what to do. Right? So the, the frequency of oscillation is given by this, this is weird number here divided by the mass, that's omega squared, everything works out. Is that cool? Questions? Let's take a minute, have a look. My purpose here being like driving in the fact that Taylor expansions are powerful. They work how we discussed last time. Anything else? Was that a part of force or potential? Part of potential energy. This is U of X. So the U of X, sorry, thank you. 
Uh, this is 12. Yeah, these numbers are confusing. I'm sorry about that. So this is u of x. And u of x, as we had here, was the repulsive piece was x to the 12th. So it still has that same behavior, but with a different power. And the attractive portion is the one which goes down, minus 6a. No, the 6 is not there again. Neither is the 12. Ah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. I haven't slept in a while. I can see that. Yeah, okay. Now this looks right. Sorry about that. Yeah. U of x, the repulsive piece, the attractive piece, put them together. That's what the curve looks like. Okay. Any other questions? All with me? Okay. Sounds good. Let's talk more about oscillations again. That's what the course is all about. We all love springs in the horizontal direction, right? We know how to solve it. What if I hang one up now? So think about a vertical spring. Now the spring is massless. There is no friction in the spring. There is no resilience. I mean, the, the whole the whole shebang of um, the good approximations. Okay, it's an ideal spring. Its equilibrium then is L naught, and the spring constant is k. Okay, again, the k, in a more physics perspective, links back to the curvature of the U of x function, which defines that spring. It's a new problem. It's not the diatomic molecule, but whatever U of x defines the spring. Its double derivative is the is the k. So the spring is just chilling. It's just hanging there, not extended, not compressed, living the good life. Okay. That equilibrium length of the spring. Now I come around and hang a mass on this spring vertically. So what I do is I hang a mass. So of course it gets a little extended, gets pulled down, and then once I slowly just leave it it'll come to a halt again at a certain extension, right? It extends, there's a spring force pulling you up, gravity pulling you down. The equilibrium point with this mass on is something larger than L0, okay? <coughs> let's see what that is. So let's say the spring extended by a distance x0. Okay? Again, find the equilibrium points before you do anything else. That's where the money is. Around that point, the oscillations already happen. Okay? Not just about x, it's about the equilibrium point. So at equilibrium, let me call this y naught, because y just feels right in the vertical direction. Okay, at equilibrium, what are my forces? Mg on the mass pointing downwards, what's the spring force? It's upwards, how much is it? K times L naught or X naught? L naught plus X naught. Why not, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a trick question. Okay, so at equilibrium, the net forces have to vanish out, and therefore gravity is balanced by the spring force Spring force depends only on the extension of the spring, which is y naught. Y naught, right? K times y naught, and this must matter. So at equilibrium, mg equals k times y naught. That's the condition for equilibrium. That's the that's the parallel to this condition that we had in the diatomic molecule. Find that location, the sweet spot that things don't move around. That's equilibrium. Okay, now say I displace the mass over and above the equilibrium a little bit. So I perturb it slightly more. I pull it down a little bit more to a distance, let's say another delta y. Okay, so I pull this down very slowly and leave it. What's the net force now on the, on the mass? Easiest one, gravity is still mg, okay? mg still points down. What about the spring force? I extended the spring a little bit more, still extended, pulls me upwards, 
So a minus compared to the gravitational direction of the force, k times what mm -hmm. length should integer? Why not? Or delta y plus excellent. So y not plus delta y is the extension of this new perturbed configuration over the equilibrium. Hence, that's what I get. Okay. Again, this looks horrible. And this should be equal to m times y double dot, which is m times y naught double dot plus delta y double dot. Don't be bothered, you know, with these delta something double, not, double dots. Delta y is just another variable. Call it alpha, beta, theta, Ashmi, your name, no one cares. It's just names, okay? So don't worry about having two dots and a delta, is that worrisome, it's not. This is just a variable. I have to get the point. Okay, so that's my force equation. Now this looks weird, it has y naughts, has delta y's, but some magic happens. Let's simplify this. Again, y naught double dot is zero, because y naught is a number, it's a constant. So I have n times d squared dt squared double dot on delta y equals mg minus k y naught minus k delta y. Is this better desired? Or something else can be done here. We all okay with this? Now it has mgs and stuff floating around, but the equilibrium condition has stuff to say. Equilibrium says mg equals ky naught, hence mg cancels the ky naught, and I have m delta y double dot is minus k times delta y. So even a vertical spring has the same oscillation frequency about the new equilibrium point. The equilibrium is not just the length of the spring itself, it's changed because of gravity. Okay, so again, once you've found the equilibrium point, perturb it just a bit, write the force equation, use the equilibrium conditions, get the oscillation equation. Okay, and a simple extension of this whole thing, say if I have two strings now. So say I have two strings in the vertical. <laughs> Uh, K1 and K2 as a spring constants, I hang a mass M with them. What's the effective spring constant of these two? Just add, them. just add them up, right? It should be easy to see because from here, I'm just adding another force from the second spring. So everything just has this extra K1 out of K2. Things just add up. Okay, because for any extension, both the springs pull it up. Hence the forces add. So a, uh, a bunch of springs in a parallel combination, k effective is just k1 plus k2. Do we all see this? I kind of like glossed over the work. I'm a lazy guy, but I hope you see the connections. That two springs, two forces to add up. Okay? In your homeworks, you have the other case. You have a series case where you have to think about it two springs attached in series. Out there, the forces will not add up because this spring is not acting on this mass. It's not connected to this mass. So just adding them up is incorrect. Only this spring is exerting a force on this mass. But something else is going on in the equilibrium in the ways these two springs behave together. So think about that. But the parallel case is easier, hence I do it in class. That's how life is. So, does that make sense? Any questions? Excuse me, this is like an AMA. Ask me anything. Hopefully physics. Thoughts? Diffusions? This stuff is not the most obvious. It might feel, yeah, this makes sense, but things could be nagging at you. So pay, pay heed to them. Just speak it out and it's good to ask questions. 
Uh, okay. All right. So we've got the we got the vertical springs in. We got the diatomic molecule in. Are we on time? Okay. So I want to quickly talk about energy. I'm sure you discussed this in lectures and everything, but I want to give you a slightly different perspective of how energies work. So again, I hope you all know this by now. If you don't, please ask me. I'll, I'll give you a brief overview. But for an oscillator, the energy is conserved. You all know this? It's a conservative force. Spring force is conservative. And hence the total energy, the mechanical energy is conserved. Hence the energy of the oscillator is the kinetic piece, which is 1 half mv squared plus the potential energy, 1 half kx squared. And even though x is a function of time, x changes, v is x dot, which also changes with time, the, the combination of the two is a constant. Okay? You all know this? Very often, it will be hard to get the equations of motion like this directly by looking at the problem. Or just be harder. It might not be impossible. It's not impossible, of course. It's only just hard. What you could do is you could write down the energy of that system. Think about some configuration, like some displacement x, and write this piece down. Just write this down. Okay. So more generically speaking, energy of an oscillator function would be one half m x dot square. Okay. Plus u of x. So I'm connecting back everything together. It's not just 1 half kx squared every time. That's in the harmonic approximation. Generally, it should be u of x for a conservative force. Okay. So write that down for that system for a small displacement x, write this down. And just differentiate with time. Just do a ddt. So de dt is from here 1 half m what do I get for x dot squared with a time derivative? Chain rule. 2 times x dot times the time derivative of x dot, which is x double dot. Okay, do you all see this? When I was young, like you, I was confused about this like, stuff a lot. So please do ask me if you are not comfortable with this. All okay? Okay. Plus DDT of U of X. Okay? What's DEDT? Why energy is conserved, it's a constant, and this thing vanishes. So this is zero equals MX dot X double dot from the kinetic piece. Let me then change variables. DDT of U of X, I can write this down as du of x over dx times dx over dt. I just multiply divided by dx dx. Okay, again, this is, it's not completely legal in the right circles, but again, we chilled out people, we can, we can look at this for now. We won't be wrong. Okay? What's dx dt? x dot. So I have a zero equals m x dot x double dot plus du dx, I can see some, ah, some things are familiar now. du dx times x dot. This whole thing equals zero. You're looking for solutions, hence x dot will not be zero. I cancel it off. And what do I find? m x double dot equals minus du dx. And that is the force. Is the dt? I have a du dt. But and then I find you will call it dx. With dx dx up and down. So it does not cancel? It, it does. It does in the in the in the license of the word, but I am setting the two terms out. I'm calling this piece oh, x dot it. and I still have an x here. You see it? Sure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love that term. Okay. Um some function f of t. Okay, and I have a x as a function of t. Two different functions. Yeah. Okay. Um, but let me call this f as a function of x. So implicitly, x is a function of t as well. Okay. So df by dt 
is df dx times dx. Now do you see it? This is the velocity. That's a excellent I hope that OK is now. Ah, OK. Yeah. All right. So this thing, which is just the force, and from the energy, by doing a time differential, I can get the equations of motion now. And once you know what the potential energy function looks like, you get the force equation. So remember how in high school you had these problems about, I start here, I drop the ball, something happens, find something, something at another point. You would conserve energy, write the energy here, write the energy there, equate and solve for the unknowns. It's along those lines. Write the energies, do how they change with time, they don't, and that gives you a connection between how fast things are changing with the force field. Okay? So that's that. Okay, and I'm sure uh, we can very quickly just see how the energies look like. Um, nah, that's, that's not so interesting. I mean, we can all work it out, right? Once we know that x of t for simple harmonic motion is a sine or a cosine or a sum of the two, I can just plug it in and see how things work. I think that's not too hard. But what I'm saying is, for oscillation, x of t would be some a cosine omega t minus phi for simple harmonic motion. I can find the kinetic energy, it would be 1 half m x dot squared. Potential energy, which is u of x, would be 1 half k x squared. You just plug it in, and if I plot these functions, they will look something like oscillating cos squares or sine squares or whatever. So there will be an out of phase lag between the two. Let me start this here. So one of them is the kinetic energy, one is the potential energy. I hope I got the I hope I got different curves. Oh I didn't. Okay, so it oscillates with the with a square of the sine of the cosine with all these squares here, and you can work everything out. It's on this part. Sorry. Change it back. All right. I'll take your word for it. I cannot see from up here. It's hard. Okay. Fair. <laughs> Take some time to understand. <laughs> okay, but we all see what's going on. I'm kind of like jumping over the the basic stuff in the book because everyone has seen that before, either in lecture or Phys One A, I can imagine. But this stuff is probably more new as one of the best things you can approach with the different direction. Okay. All right. So. Um, since you guys came in pretty late today, we kind of running slow on the time, but would you prefer doing an example with springs or would you prefer doing an example with, let's say, the harder one? The harder one? Yeah. I like that approach. Question? No, I'm just spring one is more hard, so let's probably go with that. Okay, so I was preparing for this class. What was the other option? The other option was a pendulum, but not just. <coughs> a mass with a string, but like some arbitrary shaped object. Now that sounds hard and I know, but it's in the book. Alright. So, I was prepping for this class today, and I wanted to see if springs really work the way they're supposed to work. So I went and bought two springs for myself. Okay. So string one, And spring constant k and equilibrium length 2L. Okay, that's the specification on the box. String 2 has the spring constant 2k and the same equilibrium length 2L. Okay, I just got these two strings. I want to see how stuff works. So I go back home, but then again, I'm a poor grad student, right? My home is just 3L in length. 
That's just how my my is I would laugh at my flight. Come on, man! I live in a TL size room. I got to play with stuff. There's two two L length springs inside this three L length room. So I'm living the good life. I played all day. I figured stuff out. Now I want to sleep. So I want to have that sweet spot where I don't move between the two springs. Now these two springs will of course push me around. It can be wonky all night. I don't like that. So I'm going to just keep it at a location whereby I can just be still, aka the equilibrium position of the two springs. So let's say I put them in. Spring one, that's me. And spring two, a little differently. Okay. So they're all compressed together in my tiny room. Spring with length k, spring with spring constant two k, length three l of the whole thing. What I'm asking you to find for me. What distance from my left wall should I place myself such that I can be still all night? I want you to find this equilibrium length Le from the left, where the net force on me vanishes. Do we see the problem? Okay. So I can imagine if I'm putting two springs of length 2L in a 3L loop, they'll both be compressed. Okay. So from spring one, how much, where do I feel the force? Right or left? Right, because if this spring is compressed, it will push me outward, okay? So the spring force from the first spring is to the right. Okay, and what's the force? K times, that's the easy part of the spring force. Now the harder part, what displacement comes here? How much force am I feeling at the equilibrium by this spring particularly. Equilibrium length is 2L. The length it's compressed to finally is L sub E. How much has been compressed? 2L minus LE. So it's 2L minus LE. That's the compression of the spring and this is pushing me to the right. That's the force from the first spring. Second spring, Again, it's compressed because I'm squeezing stuff for you guys to like learn before I come and teach. So it's been compressed, hence the force is to the left from your side, hence this pushes me here. And what's the force? 2K, spring constant. What's the compression of the spring now? It's not the most obvious thing to be seen, to just kind of work it out, maybe, or think about it. <coughs> Equilibrium length is 2L. So compression has to be equilibrium length minus the actual length of that. Okay? So it's 2L is the equilibrium length. What's the actual length of the spring after being compressed? 3L minus L. Okay? So the compression is 2L minus 3L minus L. Okay? And at equilibrium, these two balance out. So at that point, I am just hanging in there, living the good life. I can solve for this. This is not hard to solve, right? Yeah. So when I was in that spot last night, I solved it, and I got a value L sub E was <laughs> four thirds of L. For sake of time, I'm not doing this in class, it's just algebra. Okay, so that's the length from the left side that the two forces balance out. Now, I cannot sleep. It's too still. It's at equilibrium. I cannot move. So now my question is, if I move slightly, at what frequency does the spring drop <laughs> all night? So I perturb myself slightly by delta x. I just got an x. So I perturb this further by x, okay, above the equilibrium. Now, often people ask me the question over the years, how do I know, is the spring compressed? Is the spring extended? How do I work with the sign? The signs bug everyone. Is it a minus, is it a plus, this side, that side? If I put the sign in, do I put the direction separately or not? Things like that. Trust the math. Take a case. Think of a case. 
Assume that, okay, spring one is, let's say, compressed. Think on those lines, and then under that assumption, work everything out. The math will do the talking. If you assume something, and the final answer is negative of that, you get the opposite case. So don't be scared in assuming something and working everything out consistently after that. So let's say I perturb it by x. Now if I perturb by x, spring 2 is getting further compressed. So this is definitely compressed spring 2. But depending on how large x is, spring 1 could either still be compressed or be extended. So can you want to see how much I need to extend it to start extending it? The 2L minus LE is this compression. So if I overcome this compression by X, I can start extending the spring over its equilibrium. Okay. So if you work it out, just put this back in. What you find is that if X is less than 2L over 3, spring 1 is also compressed. So spring 1 is compressed, and if x is more than 2L over 3, spring 1 is extended. When it's extended, I mean above the equilibrium length 2L. Now let's just assume one case. Okay? It could be either, depending on how large x is. Let's assume for now that spring 1 is compressed. So when I take the case, I assume that spring 1 is compressed. Okay? Now, what are my net forces? What's F? What's the spring force from the spring 1? It's pointing in the which direction? I'm assuming it's compressed. So if it's compressed, it's pushing me outwards to the right. So I take the right to be positive by convention, <laughs> plus k times. Now, what's the new compression? 2L equilibrium length minus the actual length of the spring, which is LE plus X. So this is 2L minus LE plus X. That's the force on the first spring slightly perturbed around the equilibrium point. The second spring gets further compressed. Hence the force is to the left from your, from your perspective. And so minus 2K. What's the compression now? 2L was the equilibrium length. What's the actual length of the spring now? Spring 2. 3L, 3L minus LE minus X. So it's 3L minus LE minus X. Okay? Again, okay, work it out. Just a matter of putting terms together. And what you find, I'm going to go here, pardon my board work, but so F as a function of X comes out to be minus 3K times X. The L's cancel out, everything goes away. That's what happens. So if I put up myself slightly, I'm rocked back and forth at this frequency by the springs. Okay? So I did this week after all. Any questions about that? I call this the harder part because the piece of understanding is going step by step again, equilibriums, perturbing a bit. If you're not sure what cases could be there, assume a case, work with that case, get the answers. If I had assumed x was more than 2L over 3, hence spring 1 was extended, then the spring 1 force is to this side. Work everything out, you'll find the fact the same equation sum as a Okay, so again, it's all about using the right math. Okay, we'll go for like five more minutes today because we started like five minutes late, so I got stuff to cover here. I hope you can like bear with me and have your lunch five minutes late. Thank you. Okay. Any questions about this stuff? It'll be worth saying like five minutes. I have a pretty cool thing to, you know, to show you over the next uh, few minutes. So, so far it's all been about one dimensional motion, okay? Say and if I go for a particle which moves in two dimensions. So I have my position vector r given by x and y, two coordinates in a two dimensional plane. And say they both obey simple harmonic motion. So x as a function of time, 
is a1 cosine omega 1t minus phi 1, let's say. And y of t is a2 cosine omega 2t minus phi 2. So both the x and y are oscillating. Think about you know, a pendulum hanging and I let it go around like that. So it's both motions are, are periodic and simple harmonic. Now depending on the interplay between omega 1 and omega 2, the frequencies of these two perpendicular motions and the relative phases, a bunch of cool stuff happens. And maybe we can just quickly show you that cool stuff. So what happens is, um, once you put them together, the net pattern of oscillation in this two-dimensional plane has a, has a pretty sexy name. It's called the Lisa Zhu figures. I'm going to put this here. So we start off with the case where the two frequencies, horizontal and vertical frequencies, are equal. They are 1. And the relative phase, phi 1 minus phi 2, is 0. And it's too bright, but yeah, that is sun. In that case, x and y are just proportional to one another, right? Because omega 1 equals omega 2, phi 1, phi 2 is just the difference of 0, hence it's just a straight line. Okay? Now see what happens when I try and change the, the connection between omega 1 and omega 2, the vertical and the horizontal frequency, if I shift them. So simple harmonic motion in one dimension was just sines and cosines. Very simple stuff, very bland stuff. The moment I start changing my frequency, let's say the phase first, the relative phase between phi 1 and phi 2. Stuff starts to happen. Depending on what the relative phase is, either you get a net circle moving, you have a line, you have an ellipse, ellipsoid, different orientations. And these things, these orientations, why I mention this right now, <laughs> <laughs> of the x and the y depending on the phases. This is what we call polarization. And light has these polarizations. It could be linearly polarized, circularly polarized, elliptically polarized. We'll talk about this stuff in detail. But the cool stuff happens when I change the frequencies of the two things. And just two simple harmonic motions put together can combine together in really awesome patterns and give you bizarre and really cool looking patterns that actually work. So just by superimposing two orthogonal direction, simple harmonic oscillations, each of which is as simple as cosines and sines, their superpositions in two dimensions shows you really cool patterns like that. And these things are called Lisa Zhu figures. Have a look if you want online more about this. And the polarization part will come back to it around week nine or week ten. So, all right, thank you for coming. I'll see you guys on next Wednesday.